Well, I am honored to be here with you all. By the way, I, I always love doing this when I speak at places. How you all doing, Faith Mountain? Great. Good. I love hearing it. I love it when everybody's excited, especially when there's a guest speaker and you have no idea what to expect and whether or not you should have slept in this morning or whatnot. I get it. I ask myself the same questions, too. But I'm excited that you guys are here, and I'm excited to be here this morning. Uh, just to uh, give you a little bit of background information on me, as uh, Ben mentioned, my wife, Melissa, uh, she is my wife. She's the love of my life, uh, my number one fan, my biggest support. Uh, she's the smoking hot girl that you'll usually see with me almost anywhere I go, keeping me in check and in line. She wants me to call her the boss. It's not going to happen, but whatever. I love her anyways, and I love to embarrass her at uh, moments in time when I can. Um, but as Ben said, we're planning on starting a church down in Colorado Springs, and uh, you know, this whole entire process of getting a church up and off of the ground is uh, a lot of hard work. Uh, I don't know that I was really expecting it to be that way, because it's the God business, right? He's the one that starts the church, and we just kind of help it move along, and uh, been really uh, enlightened with the things that we've learned and in the process we have gotten to meet some really cool people like Pat and Ben and Mitch and uh, we are honored to have them in our corner as we um, are just an hour down south of here looking to uh, bring light to a lost uh, dark and broken world so super super honored that Faith Mountain uh, has our backs in that process well uh, let me start off by saying this um, I am a huge sports fan. I love the art of competition, and I think for you to have a better understanding of who I am, I have to give you the list of my favorite sports teams across the board. Um, let me give you a forewarning, though. Uh, basically, it was almost like I blindfolded myself, took a handful of darts, threw it at a poster board of sports teams, and wherever those darts landed, I said, you, I will die on this hill for you. You are my team. Uh, so let me go through that list for you real quick. Uh, for Major League Soccer, yes, I am a Major League Soccer fan. Get over it. Um, I root for the Portland Timbers. Uh, for hockey, it's all about the Sharks. Uh, for uh, basketball, it's the Oklahoma City Thunder. Yes, reigning MVP, Mr. Number Zero himself, Mr. Triple Double, Russell Westbrook, and now we got PG-13. Things are, God's got, God's shining his grace on, on Oklahoma City. Um, for baseball, this one's fun, the Arizona Diamondbacks. Oh, I got some woohoos this time. I got booze last service. Uh, I, I like second service better. This isn't recorded, right? I don't want first service to hear that. Anyways, this, this baseball season is really, really weird. And let me tell you why. Because Arizona is usually battling for last place with the Colorado Rockies. And this year, we are uh, neck and neck tied for a playoff spot. And actually, we're battling it out for a home field advantage in that one game playoff spot. And I'm trying to wrap my head around this because the Rockies have to be cheating in some way. I haven't figured it out yet. Now, for me, it, 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 this is weird territory to be in because Arizona, uh, even just a couple of years ago, was dead last in all of Major League Baseball. And, and so it's weird for my team to be battling for a playoff spot, but what's weird to me is Colorado's figured out there's a second half of a season. So I'm used, so for this being weird territory for me and my team being last place, uh, you know, battling out for second right now, I, can't, I can only imagine how weird it is for you to know that your team now has a complete season. So congratulations on that. Now let me say this one, because there is still one more uh, sports team, and there's a major, major uh, sport that everybody around here should love. If you don't, that's weird, but whatever, we'll pray for you. But when it comes to the NFL... I bleed blue and orange for the Denver Broncos, baby. And if you're a fan of any other team in this room, you're a sinner in desperate need of a savior. I love my Denver Broncos. Now, I also have to say this one. Because as a Denver Bronco fan, it's hard for me to say this. And it's probably going to be hard for a lot of you to grasp. But somehow, Raider fans will be in heaven. I haven't figured it out yet. It's called God's grace. But you'll be able to tell them apart 
because they're the ones that are going to smell like smoke, just barely escaping the flames of hell. But we have to love on them anyways. If you're a Raiders fan in this building, I'm not looking at you, Ben. You might be a wolf in sheep clothing, I'm just saying. All seriousness aside, because we all know sports is serious business. <laughs> Let me uh, start off by asking this question. Do you know a difference maker? It might be somebody that you know personally. Maybe it's a, a friend, a family member. Uh, perhaps it was a pastor that you had in your life, a, a teacher, or maybe even a coach. But do you know a difference maker? Because this world is chock full of them. Maybe, just maybe, it's not somebody that you know personally, but it's, no, it's somebody that you know of. Uh, for me, when I think of a difference maker, I don't think of Kevin Durant. You joined a superior team, you loser. Sorry, I'll get over it. Um, I think of a guy like Steve Jobs. Whether you like Apple or not, dude made a huge, huge impact on this world. You can't go anywhere and not see somebody using an Apple device of some sort. I mean, for crying out loud, I wrote my message on a Mac computer. I'm using an iPad mini for my notes, and I have no fear of my phone blowing up in my pocket. <laughs> this is why Apple's superior, folks. <laughs> Other difference makers that I think of, one comes to mind, uh, spe especially within this area, I think of Von Miller. Think about it. Dude is a one-man wrecking crew for that dominant Denver defense. If it wasn't for him, there's a probably a good chance that we wouldn't have won Super Bowl 50 against those battle putty cats that are in Carolina. And to be honest, we might not have even made it past the Patriots in the AFC championship game. I'll let you take in the images and how glorious they are. Uh, fun note, uh, during Super Bowl 50 and the whole entire amazing run that we had that season, my wife and I were living in Connecticut, the heart of New England. Uh, I was working as a student pastor out there, and they have this tradition as Patriot fans that when the Patriots win a football game, the very next day, you get a free cup of coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. That's nice of them. Charity for the poor, I guess. Anyways, uh, the greatest thing that season as a Denver Bronco fan living in the middle of New England was that season we beat the Patriots twice. <laughs> so everybody had to pay for coffee and I'm strolling around with a free cup of coffee I made at home wearing my Broncos gear. <laughs> I was the most hated person in the New England area, I tell you what. So there's difference makers within the world and if we open up our Bibles, we have a list of people who were difference makers, and, and they made significant impacts during their own time. Uh, in fact, when we think of difference makers within the Bible, we can usually spout off names easily. Moses, Abraham, Noah, Daniel, uh, Nehemiah, Peter, Paul. And, and if I wanted to, I could spend the whole entire morning just talking about the difference makers of the Bible and the differences that they made, but we would never make it to lunch. And dinner is a little bit questionable. And as a guest speaker, you are already wondering if we'll make it to lunch today. We will, I promise. So this morning, I want to focus in on one difference maker. And, and before I focus in on this person, I want to ask this question. Does anybody in here, by raise of hands, do you have any Jewish heritage running through your family? Any at all? Some of you. Now, think about this. The person that we're going to look at today, their biggest significance that they had, the difference that they made, if this person didn't do anything, there's a good chance that you wouldn't be here today. So the person that we're going to look at today, you may have heard of their story in the Bible. You may not have. You may have never even heard this person's name before. But we're going to be looking at the biblical difference maker that we know as Esther. Now... Before we look at the, the event that, Esther, uh, that turned Esther into the difference maker, we've got to get a little bit of background, right? And thankfully, Esther chapter 1, verse 1 gives us some really good, solid background information. Because during that time, the Jewish people were ruled under the Persian Empire. And the king during that time was a guy by the name of Xerxes. Now, that name might sound familiar to some of you, especially if you're into watching rated R movies that shouldn't be mentioned in church. He's the king of 300, and he's a towering figure. 
He, he ruled an empire that stretched 127 provinces. And uh, let me pause for a second. I can't go on. Ladies, if you've seen the movie 300, I need you to stop, talk, or stop thinking about Gerard Butler right now because you're really going to miss the point of this message. And guys, stop flexing. You're not impressing anybody. <laughs> but he had a huge empire between he and his father, Darius. It stretched over 127 provinces, and it stretched from uh, India to Ethiopia. And as we open up in the book of Esther, what the very beginning chapter tells us is that uh, this story is going to take place at their fortress in Susa, which is modern-day Iran. And Xerxes is a big-time partier. In fact, it tells us this, that in the third year of his reign, this is verse 3, he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and officials, and he invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as all the princes and nobles, of the provinces. This is a party that lasted 180 days. Now, can you imagine that? A party lasting 180 days? For some of you that went to college, you maybe didn't graduate, but you went to college. I played that game too for a little while. You mastered in partying and minored in a good time. For us as Bronco fans, we're still riding that Super Bowl 50 wave, and we're still partying from that one. That's the only thing we have to compare to this. And we would think that after 180 days of partying and drinking and everything, you would think that Xerxes would be done, right? I mean, that's a significant amount of time. Well, the story continues in verse 5. It says, when it was all over, talking of the party, the king gave a banquet for all the people from the greatest to the least who were in the fortress of Susa. And it lasted for seven days. So obviously he liked these people a lot less, but he knows how to have a good time apparently. So he throws a party for seven days uh, for the people within uh, Susa. And it was during this time that Xerxes makes the greatest mistake a man can ever make. You see, I love my wife and I respect her, but I would never do what Xerxes did. You see, Xerxes' request for his queen, Queen Vashti, to come and present herself in front of all of his friends. And he says, hey, I want her to come wearing her crown. And, and we get this uh, recorded in verse 11 and 12, when it says that when the message was relayed to Vashti, she refused, and rightfully so. And it says that this made the king furious and he burned with anger. So we can kind of see why Xerxes would be upset, right? He makes a request, he's king, it should be followed through with. But to give you a little bit better of an understanding of what's going on here, yes, he requested for his queen to come to him and to present herself in front of his friends wearing a crown. But to give a little bit better context to what's going on, he wanted her to wear nothing but the crown. Like I said, I love my wife. I would never ask her to do this. I believe she's smoking hot. But it would never justify me asking her to present herself in front of my friends. Now, I love her and I respect her. And there's a second reason why I would never do this. Look, I love Jesus, and I want to be in heaven someday, but I do not want to speed up the process because she would kill me if I ever made that request. <laughs> So the story continues on. So Vashti refuses. Xerxes gets angry. You don't tick off the most powerful man in the world. So what does Xerxes do? Well, the only thing that he knows how to do, he puts together a party, basically. He's putting on a beauty pageant, and he requests for his officials to go out to all 127 of the provinces and bring back the most beautiful women that are found within his kingdom. And what he wants is he wants them to get dolled up, and then he wants them to be paraded in front of the only judge of this beauty pageant himself in search of the next queen. Now the story continues on in verse 17 because Esther enters onto the scene and Esther is one of these girls as part of this beauty pageant. And verse 17 says, And the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. So Esther's now queen. She has been elevated to a position of power, a position of authority, and all of a sudden the story of Esther takes a turn because we've been focused on Xerxes and Esther, and all of a sudden we get introduced to a third character of the story, a guy by the name of Mordecai. 
Now let me give you some background information on Mordecai. Mordecai lived in Susa, and he adopted Esther. In fact, he is the cousin to Esther. And so he's living in Susa, and one night, as he's going about town, he overhears two of Xerxes' men plotting an assassination attempt. Now, what we've learned from the Bible is that sometimes we may not like it, but God places people in authority, and we have to honor and respect that person. And so honoring the person that God has placed over Mordecai, he goes to uh, his adopted daughter, her, his cousin, and says, hey, there are two men that are attempting an assassination of your king. You should probably go report this back to him. So Esther reports the message back, and an investigation work is done, and it turns out that, yes, there are a couple of guys that are planning this assassination attempt of Xerxes, and they meet this fate of being impaled on a sharpened pole. So we have Xerxes, Esther, and Mordecai. And chapter 2 closes, and chapter 3 opens, and we get introduced to a fourth character of this story of Esther. We get introduced to this character by the name of Haman. Now, let me stop here for a second, and I want to say this. I love the name Haman. Uh, for a, I don't like who he is, and I don't like what he does within the story, but I love the name Haman, because here's the reason why. I have a hard time with names. I have a hard time remembering names, and he would be, like, the easiest name for me to remember, because I would see him coming from, like, off in the distance. and be like, hey, man! And this self-centered guy would probably sit and be like, oh, this dude loves me. He remembers my name. I don't love you, but I love your name. So if you're planning on having kids and you're going to have a son, I suggest Haman. His name will never be forgotten. But Haman is an Agagite. And it says this in uh, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, sometime later, King Xerxes, Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Amadatha, the Agagite, over all the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. Pause. He's the Agagite. Why is that important? I'm glad you asked. You see, if we rewind back a few years, we get to the book of 1 Samuel. And in that book, we get told that King Saul at the time is told to go to war against the Amalekites and wipe them off the face of the earth. And Saul does a pretty good job, besides for the fact that he decides to spare the king. And the king's name was Agag. Agag turns out to start his own people, the Agagites starting to sense a little bit of tension building here. But wait, there's more. The verse continues on in verse 2 in chapter 3. It says, All the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by, for so the king had commanded. But, I love big butts in the Bible, and I cannot lie. But Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. Haman most likely knows his heritage, he knows his ancestry, he knows his background, he learns of Mordecai's heritage, he's already burning with anger over this guy because he refuses to do what the king commanded and bow down to him. Remember, this guy is full of uh, self-centeredness. You think that he has a hatred for Mordecai? He has such a hatred so much so that he whispers in King Xerxes' ear, hey, there's a group of people in your kingdom. The, the Jewish people, they're stubborn, they're rebellious, we need to get rid of them. And he grabs Xerxes' ear so much that Xerxes makes a decree that within a year, these people, under his authority, under his leadership, under his rule, should be wiped off the face of the earth. But it doesn't stop there, because Haman hates Mordecai so much that he has something special planned for him. You see, he sets up a 75-foot sharpened pole just for Mordecai. Haman learns, or Mordecai learns of everything that's about to happen to his people, and he becomes brokenhearted about it, and rightfully so, and he mourns over everything that's about to happen, and he puts on mourning clothes, and his cousin, his adoptive daughter, Esther, learns of this and sends out some officials to ask what in the world's going on. And, and uh, Mordecai gives back the report of, we're about to get wiped out, and something's got to happen. In fact, Esther, I need you to be the one that does it. I need you to bend the ear of your husband and need you to put a stop to this. 
The story picks up in chapter 4, starting in verse 11. Esther, in response to Mordecai's plea, says this, All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. We're getting a really good picture of who the Xerxes guy, guy is. He's not that great. Mordecai sends this reply in verse 13. It says, Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such, for just such a time as this. To which Esther replies, Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Now, the book of Esther is a good grand total of 10 chapters, and the story goes on and on and on. And so I'm going to try to make a long story short. Esther, following in the footsteps of her king, her husband, decided to throw a couple of banquets just for two people, for Xerxes and Haman. At which point in time, Xerxes is so pleased with what Esther has done, he tells her, anything you want, it's yours, even up to half my kingdom. Just tell me what it is that you want. To which point, Esther pulls aside Xerxes and says, you know that decree that you passed, saying that the, all the Jewish people should be wiped out? That decree that Haman told you should be done? Were you aware that that meant my own demise? That Haman, this wicked, evil, awful person, Haman, is out to kill me. Esther turns the tides on Haman. And the story ends with basically uh, Haman being impaled on the pole that he set up for Mordecai and a new decree being sent out by Xerxes saying, all Jewish people, you fight for your life and defend yourself against that original decree that I passed out. And because of that, the Jewish people are saved. So Esther is this difference maker. And what Esther's story tells us is that in order to be a difference maker ourselves, we have to do something. And that's the one point for today, is we have to do something. And I know that sounds simple. Like, gee, I'm so glad we got this guest speaker to come in and tell me I need to do something. I get it. It doesn't sound so intensive. But the reality is, Sometimes we don't do anything. You see, because in Esther's story, she didn't have to do anything about the doom and gloom that were coming upon her people. The reality is, she can have made the safe assumption that as queen, she would have escaped the fate of the Jewish people, that she would have been saved. But her cousin tells her, not the case. You see, Esther, I, Mordecai, I'm going to make my own assumption and let you know now that you're probably not going to survive this either. So you have to do something about this, and you have to do it quickly. To which point, Mordecai says maybe the most famous line in all the book of Esther, when he says, who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Now, what I love about the story of Esther is this is our story, isn't it? We've been charged by King Jesus to go and do something. Matthew chapter 28 would sit there and tell us that it is our responsibility because we've been commissioned to preach, to baptize, and to make disciples. We've been told we have to do something, but the reality is a lot of us don't. And my fear is with the overall capital C church is that we reflect more of the Laodicean church that's found in the book of Revelation than we do any other. And you know about that church, right? Let me remind you, if you don't remember, in Revelation 3, uh, verses 15 through 16, Jesus says this. He says, I know all the things you do, that you're neither hot nor cold. 
I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You see, our friends and family can't afford for us to be lukewarm Christians. We cannot be content with our own salvation while we sit there and do nothing and say to hell with everyone else. We have to do something about it. We can't be team Jesus and sit on the fence. Now, the thing that usually happens is we say, but God hasn't spoken to me. God hasn't told me what it is that I am supposed to do. And the funny thing is, God didn't tell Esther what to do either. A fun fact of the story of Esther is, at no point in time does God ever speak. In fact, at no point in time in the whole 10 chapters of the book of Esther is God even mentioned. In fact, it's because of the, those two things right there that is widely debated whether Esther even belongs in the Bible. But even though God doesn't speak, his presence is felt throughout the whole entire story. But let me say this. God does speak, and he has spoken. He tells us every day what it is that we're supposed to do. Let me give you a couple of fresh reminders. In Matthew chapter 22, 37 to 39, it says this, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Verse 38, this is the first and the greatest commandment in 39. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. When I walked in here this morning, the first thing that I noticed were the pictures. Love God, love others, create followers. You can't tell me God hasn't told you to do something. But let's continue on. Micah 6, 8. Know, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Joshua 1, 8. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Second Chronicles 7.14, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. God has never kept it a secret on what it is he wants us to do. He speaks and he speaks loudly that it's time for us to do something. It's time for us to be difference makers. For the past few years, AMC, uh, the, the television network, has been running a show called Turn Washington Spies. I'm a huge, huge history fan. Um, it's just a, a passion of mine. And, and the whole entire concept of this show was that George Washington had a group of spies that helped him win the Revolutionary War. And one of those spies within his network was a guy by the name of Robert Townsend. And the show has recently, um, as of last week, come to an end. So if you've never seen it, I highly, highly encourage you to go find it and binge watch the whole entire thing. It's amazing. Uh, just all the different characters that played a role in just this nation forming. But Robert Townsend uh, says this in the second to last episode. He says, those who sit on the fence are often impaled by it. So we got to do something. In your notes, there's this nice little section in there that I asked the staff here to put in there that just boldly says, do something. How are you going to make a difference? And I wanted them to put it in there because I want you right here, right now, to write in what it is you're going to do to make a difference. Now, before I go on to the next part, let me say this. I didn't say this during first service, and I really, really regret it right now. Because here's the reason why. God did something for you. He took a beating. He took spitting of the face. He took nails. He took whips. He did all that for you because you were that important. You're here today because somebody did something for you, whether it was a family member, your parents, or a friend, sat there and said, I found this hope 
and it's in Jesus, and I want you to come to church with me and check this out. Somebody did something and made a difference in your life. Now, the reason why I want you to write down what your one thing, what your do something is going to be, is because most likely God has already been telling you what that one thing is, and you just keep having cold feet from doing it. I get it. Me too. Maybe, just maybe, that one thing is something as simple as when you go out to lunch today or dinner tonight or the next time you go out, you leave a tip that is bigger than the overall bill. Now, let me caution you, if you go out to dinner with a big party and you're the one paying the tab, you're probably going to break the bank. But do something. Maybe that one thing is that you invite that coworker or that friend with you to church. Or maybe it's just something as simple as at least having that conversation with them about the spiritual journey that they're on, because everybody's on one. We just all find ourselves in different places. Maybe that one thing is you getting involved and serving here at Faith Mountain. Maybe that's students, maybe that's kids, maybe that's serving with a coffee team, maybe that's greeting somebody at the door. But you got to do something. You see, I, I said that it's probably the most famous line that comes out of the book of Esther, but it rings true today. That we live in a dark and broken world and we can't turn on the television set or any of the radio stations and listen to the news without hearing of some other protest, some other violence, some other terrorist attack going on. And we wonder what in the world is going on and all at the same time God is saying, I designed you for such a time as this. There's no mistake that you're here. So you got to do something. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for today. And thank you for the word that you have spoken. I, I thank you that I got to play just even a small role in that, that I could amplify the message that you want piercing through the hearts of each and every one of your people. God, the reality is that all of us are in this room right here, right now, because somebody did something and made an impact on our lives. So, Father, I pray that we stop being lukewarm about our faith, that we stop being content with our own safety and understand that there is a broken world out there, that people are dying every day, and the reality of your word tells us that there really is a heaven, there really is a hell, and people are going to one place or the other. And God, let that move us to be sickened by the idea that anybody would spend eternity away from you. Father, heat us up. Take us as far away from being cold. Take us as far away from being lukewarm where we're just sitting on the fence or we are nothing more than just spectators watching this game go on. But Father, help us move into the game so we can help in the process of advancing your kingdom even further down the field. Father, move us into action. And thank you for doing something for us that a message like this is even possible that to know that even though it is a dark and broken world. That you did something about it. We just anticipate and look forward to the day that you come and see that the battles that we faced here on earth were so worth it. Help us finish the race. We love you and we lift this up in your son's name. Amen.